welcome you here today, Christian Gathering Church, Valley View. Every Sunday, it seems to look a little different. It's kind of the way our life is right now, isn't it? Aren't we glad that God is consistent? He's a faithful God in an inconsistent world. He's a faithful God even when we're not faithful. And uh, so I welcome you, whether you're sitting at home by yourself or whether you one of those has chosen to gather this morning, cold and rainy day, but it is a beautiful, warm, great spirit in this place. It's shining bright. The spirit of the Lord is shining bright. And uh, that is what we hope for you today, that you feel that. It's hard to put stuff over the air that you just can't, you just can't do. It just doesn't work as well as it does when you're sitting here together because there's something about together. Is that not right, people? There's something about being together. He talks about just two or three gathered together. There's something special in a midst. Midst means like a circle. There's a midst. It's in the middle of us. That's what he wants to do today is being right in the smack dab middle of our lives, our situations, our homes, our marriages, our families, our country. And when we get that off kelter, sometimes things, everything's out of balance when we forget to make him the center. He doesn't just want to be a spoke on the wheel. He wants to be the center, the hub. So this morning, we welcome you here. And as the song just said, come to the table. I think Zach Williams is one of the most anointed songwriters and singers today. And I have a video of that. And I, want, and I don't have it. If you can look on it, it's actually he recorded in the middle of a prison. He's singing to those men. I love it. It radiates with me because I worked in the prisons. But he's singing to those men. And come to the table. I, um, I'm going to talk about having a place at the table this morning. I've had this, I've had this word in my heart for some time, and I was calling it two tables because there's two tables we've all been invited to in life, and there may be others. But uh, Sister Debbie had posted this song just at the right time, had people just can post at the right time, and. It's come to the table business, and I was like, oh my goodness, it's time to, to teach this. It's a, I believe it's a current message, a timely for you in this house and in your house or wherever you are listening today. That we have an invitation. On the first covenant, it was a limited invitation. There was a certain family called the Hebrew children that had an invitation to the covenant. On this side, he said, whosoever will, let him come. There's a table spread. There's an old hymn that just jumped in my mind. I don't know the words. I just start singing it right now. Brother Stevens is looking at me. He probably knows the words. But it says something like this. He who had... He, has a table spread where the saints of God are fed to the he invites his chosen ones come and dine aren't we glad now that we're all chosen ones <laughs> come and dine the master calleth come and dine that's the word today is come and dine the scripture I want to use is Psalms 23 5 very common passage of scripture. If you've been to very many funerals, you probably saw this on the back of little of the little pamphlet they put out, or you've heard this. And that's Psalms 23, where David talks about the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. He will supply all my needs. In other words, but there's a line in there that says in the fifth verse, he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, the truth is, I've heard that many years, and I kind of thought about that table being about what was on the table. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I kind of think, maybe I thought, I don't know, and there's been many messages, and I'm sure they all have an aspect of this, but I just got a different one this week. That this was not just about what was on the table, that, hey, all my enemies, everybody that tried to trip me up, everybody tried to get me, they're like, ah, look at me now. <laughs> look at this table spread. I, you know, don't you wish you were here? My enemies are seeing me be, have the blessings of the Lord. And I'm not saying that's not an aspect of it, but I realized something today. To me, it's not as much about what's on the table, but having a place at the table. 
When he said to me that when I heard this week, you prepared a table for me. He didn't talk about what was on the table. He said, you prepared a table. And I realized what a big deal it, ha- it is in life to have a table where you have a chair. Things are a little different in this generation. Not everybody sits around a family table like I did. We sit at the table. We knew which chair was daddy's chair. We knew which were mama. I knew where my chair was. And people kind of do that in church now. Like, don't sit in my seat. That's my seat. That's my chair at the table. But you know what? There's something about having a chair at your table. There's a sense of belonging when you know you have that chair. Not everybody sits around the family table, do they? And that family table may sit around, you may be sit around the coffee table. You may be sitting around. It don't have to look a certain way, but you know what your family table looks like. Oh, the thing is, is I had one of those ideal families that seemed to be blessed, one of those generational blessings because my grandma changed her life. It trickled down all the way. But us kids, we, we didn't eat before somebody prayed too. We gonna, you sat down, prayed, blessed the food, and then you eat. Well, we don't really have a lot of that going on there. doesn't mean it's not important. But let me tell you something. Nobody's family's perfect. And even though we were blessed to have a mom and daddy that were married 40, uh, 52 years before daddy passed, that was a blessing. But there's four of us siblings. Our families don't look the same today. I have the four. Gary and I are the only ones that we've been married for 42 years and been able to have that. But my brother's wife died young. She died, uh, you know, and so his table looked different, right? They were married 25 years, and all of a sudden, this young wife ends up passing away of ALS at 46. That's just, that's just don't seem right, does it? Oh, it doesn't seem right. Things in life just don't seem right. Two of my siblings have had to suffer the terrible pains of divorce. There's nothing like divorce and death and, and disease that can just mess up our tables, right? And I dare say there's a lot of people right now listening to me, and even in this room, you have empty chairs at your table this year. We already prayed this morning. We had a tremendous prayer meeting here in this building. We prayed for the sick. We prayed for those that are ailing. We also prayed for those that are suffering empty chairs right now. We want to be mindful. We don't be some church that's so into our little program that we forget to be mindful. When I say church, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about individuals. We are the body of Christ. And this is a call today to remind us who we are and that people need to be reminded that he's prepared a table for them. You know, I think about our family. I think about our tables have changed. And, and, and also, when we, we usually get everybody together. We didn't get to do that Thanksgiving. It looked very weird this year. But invariably, when we get together, everybody, we had adult tables and we had kid tables, right? We had kid tables. And, you know, one of our kid tables looked real different this year. We had a little, well, I don't think she quite made the seventh birthday, Layla, that passed this year. So we had an empty chair at the children's table this year. Cancer, brain stem cancer. Ooh. <sighs> Things look different. We have got to know that there's more than what we have in the natural. Because just like I said, our family, mom and daddy might have been married 52 years. Our family's had its stuff, right? Did I mention disease, divorce, division, those things? They affect people. And as the body, we need to be so in tune that we can remind them that he said, not me, but God said. Through his servant David, he prepares a table for me. In the midst of my enemy. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes it's not somebody that's your enemy. It's not the neighbor there that got into a hassle with you over your dogs. Why is it other people's dogs want to come to your yard to do their business? I don't know. We can have fallouts with people over stuff. Now, I think the biggest enemies that he prepared and said, I have a a table prepared and you have a place. The enemy that we have is thinking, I don't have a place. I don't fit in. I don't fit there anymore. I, I, I'm a misfit. And we believe all kinds of enemy lies in our head that may have been perpetuated by true situations. 
I read a lady this week, and, and, and it stirred me up. She had put a post on uh, one of the social media, and she said, I, ab I, I have absolutely no place to go for Christmas. And that jumped out at me. And I thought, oh, I wonder why. You see, that most people have somebody that loves them and somebody that's inviting them to the table, but some people don't. Some people literally don't have people. I worked with kids, and incarcerated kids at Ward of the State. They had nowhere to go. They didn't even go to when they got out. The reality is there's people today that have nowhere to spend Christmas. I thought, I wonder if it's one of those Ds. I wonder if it's because of death. Maybe her family's died. Maybe she's an orphan. Maybe, maybe it's because of divorce. Maybe it's because of division. Maybe it's because of the disease called COVID right now. But these are things that can cause things. That people go, I have nowhere to go. I thought, I'm going to tell her, I, I, you got a place to go. My first thought is like, you come over to my house. Then I remembered, well, we're, well, I don't even know what Christmas is going to look like at my house this year. It may just be like Thanksgiving, my immediate. I'm not even sure. But what is going on here that's bigger than me doing what I've always done and getting what I've always got? But see, I've learned some things about having a table. Our family also learned something, and Gary and I knows this, I knew it, and somebody reminded of it, me of it this week. When I worked at the uh, Texas Youth Commission announced juvenile justice, uh, we were privileged to be able to, each holiday, we could take two kids out. I could do that. I don't think they do that anymore. As a chaplain, we'd pick, well, I'd get two kids, and we could take them home with us. And we would take them for Thanksgiving or Easter or, or Christmas. And we have those kids. They were strangers, basically. We invited them to our home and we'd eat with us. And I'm telling you, it helped, kept my kids on target. They learned to love these kids. They learned, we learned to, to look at them and not say, well, just throw away the key, that little gangbanger. No, when you meet that little gangbanger uh, face to face, you have a different opinion, right? It's easy for people to say, oh, just throw. They did the time. They did the crime. Do the time. Throw away the key. The church has even got that kind of junk in our head. But I'm telling you something. He showed me something. And he also told us this. He said, you need to be careful to entertain strangers because some of you have entertained angels unaware. Sometimes it was just a test to have your love. Did, did you really listen to the Holy Spirit when they said, do this and entertain means do something, interact with them. Maybe it's not just stopping and giving them a dollar on the corner. Maybe it's stopping, pulling over and saying, hey, do you have a place to spend Christmas? Or, do, or can I do something? I don't know what this looks like, but we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit because he said, I have a table spread. I paid a terrible price to have a table spread that whosoever will let him come. People need to know that they can come to the house, not just the house of the Lord we call the church. It's that He's messing with that paradigm, isn't he? We are the house of prayer. We are the temple of the Lord. What is it he wants me to do as the body of Christ to interact and pay attention to those around me that has empty chairs or those that have nowhere to go? If they post it on Facebook, somebody needs to pay attention to that. You see, the first table we can talk about is that table of relationship and family. I mentioned that there's two tables. I may not even get to the second table. I may just put a, I may go home and record part B for you. But the truth is right now, the first table we got to know is the table of family because everything in this kingdom is about family. God is love. And what is love if you don't have something to pour love into? I think that's one of the reasons he created humanity because he's love and he made us in his image so he could actually have a relationship on an equal with us. We're not God, but we are like we are, we are children that can actually have the same attributes. You can't have a full relationship as Gary thinks we can with our Elliot, our little dog. The truth is he's not on the same level, but he made you on the same level. He made you. When I say level, I'm talking about his, his image. He's Father, Son, Holy Ghost, your body, soul, spirit. And from the very beginning, the plan was family, was it not? He made Adam, and he said very quickly, okay, I want to have a relationship with Adam. But he goes, but wait a minute, Adam, it's not good. You'd be alone. So now he gives him a, a wife. He gives him a woman. And then he made it in such a perfect thing that now when those two came together in relationship, what was created? Children. It was the first order of business, be fruitful and multiply. You see, I, I saw another little meme this week that said, um, everybody is born, in fact, I posted it. It was from years ago. I remember I reposted it. It was a memory. It says, everybody is born with the desire to be loved, and we never outgrow it. Is that not the truth? 
That's the God in us. God is love. People do some crazy stuff when they're not, they don't feel loved. In fact, hurting people hurt people. The worst thing that'll hurt you in the world is make you feel unloved. People out here doing stuff because they don't feel loved and say, now they're hurting people, hurt people, or they do some stuff, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. I've seen people stay in horrible, terrible relationships just because somebody makes me feel loved and wanted. And it's so scary to let go of that because what would I have? The only way you can truly let go is to know if I can let go of that, I can grab a hold of this. And when he will walk me out, he'll walk, walk through me with that. That little woman that's been abused and watching her kids be abused and know that's the worst thing that can happen. She don't know how to get any further because we got to tell her, you don't have to do this alone. Not only God will walk through and do absolute miracles for you, I've seen it happen, but let me tell you more, I will walk with you. The Bible says you have many teachers, but not many fathers. What he's saying, everybody wants to tell you what to do, but not many people want to parent you. I said this last week. Not everybody wants to, to, to help walk you through these things because it's inconvenient. Oh, he's calling his people back to where we need to be. It's all about the table of the family. You need to know. We've got to get some stuff right with our churches, guys. When we came here... First, when we first became the shepherds in this house, his sheep, he said to me, first of all, he said, I take it very personal how you treat my sheep. And I, it's been in my head, everything. they're his sheep. Whoever listening, you're not my sheep. You're not your pastor's sheep. You're his sheep. We've just been given a little part to play to help you stay in tune with him. That's our job, help you listen to the master. But he also said something else to me. He said, I have wounded, wandering and weary sheep that I need you to tend. And it actually was in this area. That's what he said. The Lord's been bringing me back to original vision. As I'm trying to go forth, um, I've listened to a lot of visions. We have a church full of visionaries, fantastic, prophetic gifts. But he, won't, he got me up and he said, what is your vision? I'm taking everybody's listening to them and considering that. And I, I don't believe in any one man rule, one woman rule. I believe this is a family and sick team. But he just asked me, what's yours? And he brought me back some of the visions. One of them is that I need to be very careful how I treat his people, his sheep. They're his. And then he also let me know I've got, you, I've, there's wounded, weary, wounded, wandering, and weary. And so he brought me back that, and, and I had a sister, and she said, that's your lane, Pam. That's, remember, that's what he called you. I'm like, oh, that's the truth. And I believe I'm looking at a room full of people that fit these things. And I'm also talking to you across the air that fit these. You've been wounded. You cannot live very long and not be wounded. You've been wounded sometimes by your family. You've been wounded by the people that should have loved you the most, but they were so wounded themselves. Again, hurting people hurt people. You've been wounded by people that you gave your love to that didn't love you back in the same capacity. We wasn't able. They're wounded too. Been cheated on, abused, left, lied to, let down. And not only that, that's life, family, friends. Let me tell you something else. It's been very wounded. And that's the church. What we call the church. How many of y'all have what we call church hurt? The reason why a lot of people are wandering around now, there's some people just wandering around in, in bars and clubs in one relationship or other because of the pain. But I'm going to tell you something. Some of you just wandering around and you don't have a church to go to because you're, because you're angry, you're wounded, you're disillusioned, you've been hurt by church. You gave your heart, you really meant it, you, you went and, did, and you got wounded in the house of a friend, the Bible talks about, because there's nobody can hurt you like your family. And I'm not talking about just your natural family, but even your church family. Some of the worst things I've ever gone through in my life, being a person that was raised on a church pew, was church hurt. When I saw people hurt each other, I saw church splits, I saw stuff that never should happen. But the truth is they're all just people. At some point, you got to quit blaming God for what people do. People say, I don't want to go to church or a bunch of hypocrites. A bunch of hypocrites. I'm like, well, yeah, there, there's a lot of damaged people. And it ain't a perfect church. And if it was, if you showed up, it would, it, you'd just blow that. 
Because there's no perfect people. There's no perfect church. That's just the ecclesia. That's just the gathering together of the people. We're all wounded. We all can be wounded. But let me tell you something. He says, there's people wandering now. They're wandering. They wish they could be at church. They, they're, they're searching the web. They're listening. And they're, and they're wondering. They've been wondering a long time. Some people have been away from what we call God or the church. They thought they were away from God. God never left them. And they can be talking to God about how angry I'm never going to church. But the truth is they're talking to God. I know atheists are talking to God about I don't believe in you. I'm like, well, <laughs> how's that working for you? They're wondering. But you know what else? He brought back to my attention. He said, but what, how, what was the order? It was wounded or wandering and weary he let me know that you guys are getting weary of that you're looking for a true place in spite of the hypocrites you think might be there in spite of whatever happened whatever false doctrine that we followed and some things that we thought we had right and we get back down the road and go well you know what that wasn't quite right but I knew my heart was right and I knew the preacher was preaching it was right and I wouldn't take anything for it but it got me where I am today, but it's not going to keep, I don't want to stay where I've been. How about y'all? Y'all ready to move on a little further? Because that's going to be the next table, which is the table of authority. There's the kid table, that's the family table. That means you can be a little kid, uh, all kind of ages, but there comes a time you're going to sit at the big boy table. It's where the adults are, and that's the place of authority. That's the place you're making decisions. That's where he's trying to get his people. That we can walk out and, and speak. We can speak over disease and it has to go. We can speak over people and they get delivered. Brother uh, uh, Cunningham just had a word earlier when we were preaching. He said, you need to speak freedom. We need to speak freedom over that cancer. Freedom over that disease. Freedom over that depression. Let's start speaking freedom. And we can start now speaking, hearing from the Father and giving a certain sound to this world. Because whatever the Holy Spirit says, I can say. He say, I say. That takes a place of humility, a place where I understand who I am and where I am. And let me just bring to, bring, take over this. There was a woman in the Bible talking about a table. I didn't know how this was going to fit in here, but I'm just going to put it in here. It said she was a Greek woman. She was a Gentile. And she had a, a daughter that was possessed by devils, it said. And she came and was following after Jesus, and he just ignored her. And finally, he just looked at her, you know, and he said, a woman, you know, uh, I've been sent here to the lost house of Israel. I'm on a mission. I know who I am, and I'm coming to the lost house of Israel. That means the Jewish people that he was coming of his own, and he's going to bring that remnant now into the new. And he says, it would not be fit for me to give the, 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 the bread of the children over to dogs. What? Dogs? That's pretty offensive. But see, she understood what he's talking about. She understood the culture they were in. In that point, to a Jew, those that are under that covenant, still under that old mindset, the Gentiles were like dogs. They were just, you know, over here. They was like the family pet. They had a place, but they wasn't at the table. She said, she, and so she said, truth, Lord. Truth, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Two things jumped out at me. She first, or three things. She said, truth. She's like, yeah, I know, that. I know that's how it is. I'm aware of where I am and what position I'm in. She goes, but Lord, she called him Lord. She recognized him. She said, but Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs where? The master's table. She knew he was master and lord. I've never seen that. She knew. Guys, people may not know everything about Jesus. They may not know everything. But I'm telling you, inside they know who he is. There's a God in them. There's a fire in their belly that I talked about last week. There's an inside thing in them that we speak to. She said, Lord. He looked at her and he said, wow. I've not. This is great faith. Go, your daughter's delivered. Same kind of thing was said to another man in the Bible, and his name was Lazarus. He was a beggar. He came to uh, one of the other church folks. They were rich people. His name was the rich man. Didn't give his name, just called him the rich man. But he, you know he's a Jew because he calls out Father Abraham. He came to the 
the, 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 the church house, basically, it was overflowing. And he was begging for the crumbs from his table. The word crumb, it just means the scraps. Can you just give me your leftovers? He was so caught up in who he was and what his mission, whatever it was, that he walked past that man every day. I wonder how many Lazarus are just wanting little scraps of what you have and we walk past them. We look past them. I always say, we'd never be like that man. How hard-hearted. Walk past Lazarus every day. He, you know who he was? That whole thing was a part of that whole thing Jesus talking to the Pharisees, the leaders. Who do you think he was talking about? He was talking about them. He said, you sit up here and you get your fine places at the t- head of the table. You let the poor people sit in the back. I'm going to sit up here. Look at me. I know who I am. I'm the righteous one. I'm the church. I'm the so-and-so person. He said, you are so caught up that you can't even, you don't even know the God of the universe is standing and robed in flesh in front of you and you're fixing to say crucify him. He was talking to them saying, you don't know. You're missing the picture. He said, yeah, you're doing all these little things right, man. I mean, even down to tithing at the smallest of the herbs. But he says, you miss the way to your matters. See, I believe church is not about your doctrine. I don't think it's about your programs. I, oh, I said it. It ain't even about your doctrine, guys. He said, if you understand all knowledge and you don't have charity. And that charity is more than just love. Charity is love in action. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how much scripture you can preach. I don't know if you're so holy and righteous and self-serving and give, or not self-serving, serving others even the place that you even give your body to be burned. You give all your goods to feed the poor. A lot of people give stuff because it's a tax write-off or they give it because it makes them feel really good that I just helped that. Then they move on past the season. He said, if your life is not a life of charity, then you miss the picture. You're not mature until you know how to love. I've said it over and over. Love is the PhD of Christianity. It's not the gifts. He said, I don't care if you have all gifts. I don't care if you can just speak in tongues, your face falls off, and prophesy until Jesus comes back. The reality is that's not the picture. The picture is come unto me, all you that are heavy laden and, and weary, and you're wondering and you've been wounded, and just come. I've got a message for you. We have a church. We have a gathering. I don't care if it's not a building. If it's your house. We've been encouraging our people to have what we call community gatherings. And if you haven't done it yet, take, do it. You might want this message. Take it today. It's going to be out there. Gather some people in your house and say, I want you. you need to hear what this little lady has to say. Yeah, it's a woman. Get past that. It just, just you need to hear it. <laughs> Invite some people in. Use that, that big old fancy uh, smart TV. You can pull this up on YouTube. Gather some people. Gather the, the, the ones. Not, not preaching to them. Loving on them. And if you want to share this, you may have some wounded people that's wounded by religion and wounded by Christianity that just need somebody to love them and say, I don't care about that. I don't care about that. I care about you. I remember that this year is this or that. I acknowledge your grief, I acknowledge the changes, I acknowledge. But even if there's no, no outward sign of anything, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, who is it that's wounded, wandering, that's now weary? I'm going to say this is kind of sounds funny. God says funny things so you know it's him. When he said that weary, he said they're now weary. <laughs> he said they're like a bow weevil looking for a home. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It's so country, it's so southern, but I think it means that they're tired and they're looking for a home. And that just means a place that I can say, I have a chair at that table. I was going to say about those kids at, at the state school we used to invite their home. It reminded me, I, got, I had a kid pop up. He'd been looking for me. It over, it's been over 20 years. I don't know how. It's, it's been over 20 years um, since I've heard from him. Or, uh, but I remembered him. And he said, I don't know if you remember me, Chaplain Weeby. He's not really on social media, but he found me on my, uh, my YouTube music channel. He'd search for me. He knew I sang, and he, he, he found me, and he starts telling me. He said, I want you to know some things about me. He goes, I don't know if you remember. He goes, but you took me. Took me to your house. 
he knew that he didn't fit in with us bunch of country white folks. Young man, African-American kid with a serious crime from Harris County. I didn't care about that. I didn't care. He said, you and Gary, I'll never forget you. He said, your husband was such a role model to us. Gary wasn't even there that much. Gary was driving trains. I was a chaplain. But what little bit a man. See, I always knew my job was to get their heart. As a woman, I could get in there. But my job was then to bring them men that could show them how to be men. I could bring them to Jesus. But they need to know. They need more than just somebody bringing them to Jesus. Y'all realize that? And all these volunteers just want to come in there like, oh, you know, they all said the sinner's prayer. And I'm like, well, are you going to come back? Oh, no, we can't come back. We can't get any personal information. I'm like, they need somebody to come back. They need somebody to pick them up at the gate. Oh, they're criminals. I know that. No, I'm not saying don't throw caution in the wind, but you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we're called to do some weird stuff. They're strangers at our table. They said, you took me to your house. You took me to your church. I do remember that part. He said, I've never forgotten it. Guys, this may sound like a simple message, but it's the, it's the bottom line. It's the foundation of everything. I've got so much deep stuff I'm wanting to share, but you know, he just said, stop. I've got something to say because you're my family. He didn't die for a few. Oh, I hate that doctrine. I'm sorry, I just shouldn't have said to hate that. But I, I just hate anything that divides people. I hate what he hates. Just things that hurt his people, just like you. You hate anything. You cannot have love without having hate. You cannot have love and not hate the things that harm people. That's what we have to hate. We hate the evil. Not the people. We hate the evil. And, and so you look at that and go, wait a minute, it's not them. That's something that's, that they're wounded people. I hate what happened to them. That's what I hate. I hate what happens to people. I hate when we don't do what we're called to do. Peter, he had to, Peter, he had to give him a vision. He's trying to call Peter to go to those Gentiles like that woman they called dogs. He's trying to change that system. And Peter's like, oh, no, Lord. And he's like, you know, Lord said, look, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. Get up out of yourself and go down this man named Cornelius. He may be a Greek. He may not be. He may be a Gentile that we call dogs. But the truth is he has a heart after God. That man had been given alms and prayer and seeking the Lord. Just because they look different. Just because they believe different. Stop judging people for where they are. And let the Lord lead you. Because he knows who on the inside. They may be putting all over Facebook. I'm an atheist. And they can say all kind of stuff. But when I see that. You know what? That, that's the person I'm drawn to. Not because I'm trying to go. Oh I got to win them over. To, no. I'm like they need love. And I'm going to go. The Lord told me it's not your job to convince them of me. It's my job to reveal myself to them. It's your job to love them. If you get nothing out of this but that, let me say, let me say it again. He won't be up in the knot. And get, it's not your job to convince people about me, the Christ. He said, it's my job to reveal myself to them. It's your job to love them. And in the love, they want what you have. And then he can reveal. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not going to get to table two, and that's just okay. If you want to know more about that one, I'm going to because it's huge. I'm going to teach it. I'll find a way, and you you'll find a way. You'll find me. You'll do it. But I want us today to not go too long because I want us to have some time for you to discuss at home. I want you to pray. I want you to hear more than what I'm hearing. I've said a lot. There's a scripture here that says Revelation in 3 and 20. Oh, I love this scripture. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, this ain't about you going knocking doors. I'm not saying anything against that. But let me tell you something. There's a little bit higher call. He said, I am at the door and I'm knocking. 
He said, if any man would hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I need to remind people, you need to just quiet yourself and see if you feel that knocking. What is that knocking that keeps nagging at you? Oh, you can't drink it away. You can't drug it away. You can't sex it away. You can't work it away, spend it away. I believe the Father is knocking on your door. I think he's doing what he did with the prodigal son. For whatever reason, this boy decided to leave his daddy's home. I don't know what all happened. For some reason, he got up and said, I want mine. And he went out there and spent up everything he had on righteous living. Harlots, friends, he partied hard. But at the end of that road, there was still that little knocking in his heart. He came to himself. Are you coming to yourself today? I believe there's people that's wondering that are coming to their self. He said he came to himself and he said, even the servants, even the slaves, even the servants in my father's house have it better than me out here without the father. He got up and he humbled himself and he started walking down that road. And this is the picture of the father. This is the picture of Jesus. He didn't wait for that boy to get home and take a bath and get cleaned up and said, oh, yes, father, I'll submit. I'll do it. Daddy ran run down the road of that hard-headed thing thinking he knew everything when he left. I pay my own bills. I don't need no curfew. Spiritual teenagers. He got out there and realized, no, I need my daddy. I need the family table. And he knew where to come. Do you know where to come? If you'll open, I will come in to you. I will come in. He will come in to your children, your neighbors. He'll come into you today. I love the picture where he said Jesus, after the disciples, was disillusioned. They'd been hurt. Jesus had been crucified. Their expectations were dashed. It did not look like they thought it was going to look. How many of you stood in an altar? Not too long down the road, it just didn't look like you thought it was going to look. You stood there and made vows to somebody who did how many of y'all started a job and it just didn't work out? You started a business, it didn't work out. You, you, you started that church, it didn't work out. You, you started on this, it didn't work out. And you're like, oh my goodness. Their hopes had been dashed. They watched him die. It wasn't too much longer they're out there and they said, let's just do what we've always done. Peter said, let's go fishing. We know how to fish. That's where he called him, was walking on the seashore. Come, come. Follow me and I'll make you fish your men. Well, somewhere along the way, now they're just going to go back to fishing. Some of you just went back to fishing. Didn't work out like you thought. You got hurt in church. You got disillusioned. You tried your best. This didn't work. I'm never going to get married again. I'm never going to love again. I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to work for the man again. I'm, and all this stuff, and you just walked away, and all of a sudden they look over there, and there's Jesus sitting on the shore. And what is he doing? He's got some coals. He's got some fish. He's got some bread. And you know what he said to them? Just come and dine. Boys, don't worry about it. Just come eat with me. He didn't call everybody the day he called. His, he said, come on, I know what you need. See, it's individual. Come here and sit down. We're still family. Peter, I know you denied me. I know you cussed and kicked the ground and said, I don't know the man. But I know your heart. You really didn't want to do that. You just said, I'll go with you to death. You cut the ear off a man's uh, ears, ear, ear off a man's head. He said, I know your heart. See, he knows your heart. He knows you didn't mean to get here, but it's okay. He said, Peter, I got a place. Oh, my gosh. I hadn't even got to. He said, I have a place of call. He said, but Satan's desire to sift you a week. In other words, there's still something you've got to go through before you're really ready. Some of you, go, you're not going to come back uh, 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 starting over. You're just going to come back with some experience. And you have more compassion. But he asked him, come and sit with me. Come and dine. That's what he's saying to us today. Come and dine. You need to know you have a place at the table. 
You may have never felt like you fit in. You may have never had a family table, per se. Your family table might have been sitting around a Denny's getting a special. You might have had it. You might have eaten Denny's turkey and dressing. For, I don't know. I guess, I guess there's still Denny's around. You might be a trucker. You might have been like Gary. He was on a train. He sent me a picture one time of a turkey sandwich with a bite out of it. And I was getting out of the car to go to our family because he, he was on the other end. And, and I'm walking there to eat a table full of just spread. And he's, eat, he's like, here's my turkey. It might make us all feel bad. It worked, honey. But I, keep that, I, took, I kept that picture and it popped up in the day of my memories. I thought, I wonder how many people today, for whatever reason, they're eating a turkey sandwich. Maybe they're in the military. Maybe they're in prison. Maybe they're imprisoned in a hospital with disease or COVID. Today, can we pray for people? Can we spread good news? Can we be the voice of the Savior that says, come and die and there's a place for you? You have a place. And to, I wrote this down right here. And you'll never be fulfilled or successful in your purpose without taking your place at the table. Until you know who you are. And quit saying, well, I just don't belong. I'm just not good enough. I'm just not with they, they are church. They'll stop and say, my church. I'm a part of the body. I have a place at the table. When you know you have a place, then from there, you'll be able to go to the next table, which I'm going to talk about, which is that boardroom table. When somebody's asking you for your vote, what do you think? I second the notion. There's a place of authority he's bringing us to, but it starts with the family table. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us in this room. Pray for you that's listening across today. That you're going to know that you have a place. A place that's been spread for you to be deliciously nourished today. But whatever it is that you can come, you can crawl up in daddy's lap. Your daddy may be passed on like mine. You may never even known your daddy. But I'm telling you, you have the ultimate family right now in the family of God. You just got to be willing to seek after it. People do all kinds of things to find their birth family with DNA. Ask the Lord to bring you to a family. A Christian gathering, we got that down. We know what it's like to be family. But it's not everybody supposed to come here. We're not trying to recruit you here. You don't pick your family. God picks them. You just got to want to know, and I want to belong. And you didn't know that you're God's child, and he loves you so much that you never have to feel alone or disfellowshipped uh, or disassociated again. That you have a place at the table. And if you have nowhere to go, can I challenge some of you? To go find somebody else like you and quit being, I, I don't have anybody. And just go find somebody else and be that for them. Won't you be what you want to be? What you need, be for somebody else. Invite somebody else out. If you're going, if you don't have anywhere but Jack in the Box, invite somebody else to Jack in the Box. Guys, this time, we're going to go to the big boy table as we are in the family. Lord, I thank you today for this message. It's a song that Zach... Williams wrote, or Zach, I think it's Williams, to the table. To the table. Thank you for giving that young man that song. Reminding me again that we have a place at the table. Lord, I pray for all your sheep that's been wounded. They've been wandering around like a bow weevil looking for a home. They're weary. I pray they find that place. They find that place with you so then they can also provide a place for others. That they can not only have their purpose fulfilled and who they are, that you are the plan, that they did nothing for you. If they could do nothing but even like the young man that was crippled in the Bible. He could do nothing but sit at the table. But because the relationship... Because of the relationship that his daddy had, his grandpa had, all of those things, Lord, that he had a, he said he had a table to sit at for the rest of his life. He'd been dropped with no fault of his own, but he was lame at his feet. I pray for those that's been dropped, 
by the church, by their families, by the system. Jonathan's young son, because of his relationship with David, because of the relationship we have with the king, he was set at the king's table all the days of his life. I pray for those that feel broken today. I pray for your church to renew and to restore and to grow in love, grow up in love with their king that they can look around and find those that's been dropped and invite them to the table. It's you that are standing. You're knocking on the doors. I pray for those today that will open the door and let you come in and sup with them and you with them. Have that relationship that was planned from the garden. Because everybody's born with a desire to love and we never outgrow it. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.